Um, well, <laughs> thank you everyone for, your, for joining me this evening. Uh, we do have people here in person. We also, with this camera up here, Ambassador, we have a couple hundred people watching online. My name is Justin Reich. I'm the program director of this National Church Leadership Center here at George Washington, and I'm the executive director of the National Church Society. Um, I'm pleased to have Ambassador Kurt Volker uh, here tonight, and we will be discussing the Ukrainian war and also the role that personal diplomacy plays uh, in modern crises, and the, and the ambassador certainly has experience with that. But before I introduce him formally, I would like to remind you of two things. First, the conversation is being recorded and will be available to watch in the coming days. And then second, I'm sure the ambassador would love to take your questions. So we'll, I'll be handing around a microphone later on this conversation. Ambassador Volker is a leading expert in US foreign and national security policy with over 35 years of experience in a variety of government, academic, and private sector capacities. He served as US Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations from 2017 to 2019, and as a US Ambassador to NATO from 2008 to 2009. He was the founding executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, and a part which is a part of Arizona State University based here in Washington, DC. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time this evening. I know you're very busy. Thank you very much, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here, and always happy to talk both about Ukraine and U.S. policy and what this means in the world, and also about leadership. And I think Churchill is a great example. Thank you. So let's dive right in. Um, you do have extensive experience with Europe, Ukraine, NATO. Of course, uh, all of all three of those are are, are currently um, experiencing. Uh, except in Kosovo, the first European war since 1945. Um, can you please share initially your personal reflections on the war in Ukraine and, and, and where it's at today? Right. Well, I think the most, starting with where it's at, uh, Russia is experiencing a slow defeat. And this is because they miscalculated on many, many things. They miscalculated on the quality of their own armed forces. Uh, I think a lot of money was poured into the armed forces and was misappropriated, um, stolen, corruption, bad equipment, bad training, bad organization, no reform of command and control, no delegation of authorities. And so their armed forces were far less capable than the Russian leadership and particularly President Putin assumed. Secondly, uh, Putin believed his own ideology. And if you saw, he, he published an article last summer, in which he made the argument that Ukraine is not a real country and Ukrainians are not a nationality. They are all part of Russia. And by believing that, he underestimated phenomenally the degree to which Ukrainians would organize and fight to defend their homes and their country. And so the Ukrainians have done an incredible job defending their country. And they also underestimated the improvement in the quality of the Ukrainian armed forces since the last time Russia invaded, which was 2014. And Russia did have a fairly easy time in 2014 making some advances, and they just assumed it would be even more so this time. They only gave their soldiers rations for three days when they launched the initial invasion, assuming that they would just be able to topple the government. Um, quite the opposite. Ukraine much stronger and much more uh, uh, motivated to fight to defend the country. And finally, they misunderstood the resolve of the West to help Ukraine defend itself. Uh, it, it, we, we are just now beginning to see a turn in Western support for Ukraine that is more aimed at uh, helping Ukraine recover its territory and win the war. For the first six weeks of the war, it was more limited, but still unanimity within NATO, within the European Union, of giving Ukraine arms to help it defend itself. Uh, so I think they, they missed it on all three of those things. So where we are now, we have about two weeks before the May 9th, which is the famous Victory Day parade in Russia, and Putin will want to show that he achieved something out of all this. Very difficult to do. What he's in The reality of what he's achieved is he's destroyed about a third of Russia's combat power and Russia's economy. And I saw an estimate today that the cost to Russia thus far of the war is well over $1 trillion in terms of GDP, in terms of money, uh, in terms of lost revenue. Uh, it's phenomenal. 
But what he will try to show is that he's taken the port of Mariupol, he's created a land bridge connecting Russia to Crimea, and he's able to take more of the Donbass region where Russian-speaking Ukrainians live and claim that he's liberated this. And so he will be seeking to package this in a way to say it's a success. And meanwhile, the Ukrainians, now with full-throated U.S. and Western support, are they've already pushed the Russians away from central and Western Ukraine and away from Kyiv. They're now trying to push back on the Russian advances in Eastern Ukraine and deny him this portrait of victory. And I think the next couple of weeks, we will see incredibly intensive fighting and probably the lack of Russia to make any substantive advances. If, if I can turn to diplomacy, you talked about the first six weeks of the war, and um, I'm sure everyone remembers the lead up to the invasion. Um, president Emmanuel Macron, the French president, made many overtures to uh, Vladimir Putin. And can you talk about, as a diplomat, first, what was your reaction to, to that attempted you know, negotiation in terms of diplomacy? And just give us your professional opinion on that, on, on that interaction. It's important to put yourself back in the way it looked at the time, rather than to look back with hindsight. And the way it looked at the time was that Putin had amassed a position of power. He had his military deployed all around Ukraine and in Ukraine and Crimea and in Donbas and threatening to launch an invasion. And so many people, not just Macron, were trying to connect with Putin and figure out what do you want? We, you know, how can we negotiate something that would be reasonable so there's no war? So that was at one stage there. And I think what they didn't understand was that Putin had decided to go to war already. US intelligence, based on intercepts and human intelligence, was very convinced that he had already made this decision. But, you know, everyone is like, okay, intelligence is intelligence. It can be wrong, uh, can be a false trail. Let's talk with the man. Let's see. And everybody came away with the same impression after talking with them. He's not negotiating. You know, he's, he's making these demands that basically take away Ukraine's sovereignty. And no one can give that away. No, no one negotiating with him from the West can say, OK, yeah, you can have Ukraine. Uh, we're, we can't give away a country that's not ours. Uh, and he didn't understand that. So that was one element to this. Another element to this was you did have President Biden meet with Putin and then call Putin a few times. He had Chancellor uh, Schultz in Germany, recently elected, meeting with Putin. Um, Macron running for re-election in France can't be seen to be irrelevant. So he has to talk to Putin too in order to show French voters that, hey, I'm, I'm relevant in the politics here. You know, I'm, I'm a player in Europe. I'm making sure Europe has a voice. It's not just the Americans and, or the Germans. And that was particularly important because his opponent in the French elections was going to be uh, Marine Le Pen, who would stake out a somewhat pro-Putin path. And so he wanted to already in this campaign stake out a different position for himself, uh, which then added impetus to the desire to do this diplomacy on his own. When thinking of the, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, so there's meetings with Macron where he went to Moscow, he was deliberately left outside or, or so it was said. Um, that's kind of brinksmanship in a way. Um, were you surprised that Vladimir Putin even in, allowed him to come to Moscow to, to discuss with him. Was this all a show from Putin's point of view in terms of diplomacy that, you know, you can try all you want, but we're gonna invade anyway? So I think Putin loved the idea that Western leaders were falling over each other to try to come see him in Moscow. And he could keep them waiting for two or three hours at a time and say, see, I'm important, I have power, you need me. Okay, let's hear what you have to say. And then he could contradict them publicly in the press conference and send them on their way. And I think he loved this because it gave him the appearance 
of being incredibly powerful, uh, which is what he wanted to convey both internationally uh, in terms of putting pressure and, and creating the psychological dynamic that Russia would destroy Ukraine if it, if it wanted to, and also creating the image domestically that he's this great powerful leader in Russia. So I think he loved that. And I remember uh, when you, you put this in context, so I remember uh, shortly after I left being ambassador to NATO, one of the last things we did at the Strasbourg Kell Summit in 2009 was launch this um, senior experts group that was going to be providing advice about a new NATO strategic concept. And Madeleine Albright, whose, whose funeral was today, uh, was the US co-chair of this group. The European co-chair was Hugo Verlin, a uh, former French foreign minister. And they went to Moscow to meet with Putin to say, we're taking input from all quarters on what the future of NATO should be. And we want to talk with Russia. We want to hear what you have to say. And he kept them waiting for three hours <laughs> in the foyer before allowing them to come in and see him. And then when they met with him and they asked him what his thoughts were, he said, I think NATO should be destroyed. You know, uh, we, I don't want NATO to continue to exist. And so it was very blunt and bold at that time. Now, 12 years ago, where he was sending a very clear signal and we shouldn't be surprised at what we're seeing now. I was very surprised when, um, I don't know if you remember, just a few days before the invasion, the UK foreign um, minister, Liz Truss, met with Sergei Lavrov and I was surprised, and she was basically reading from a script, and he was mocking her. And I was so I was surprised at the um, rigidness of, of of what she was saying. Do you think Western diplomats were too cautious with their Russian counterparts in the lead up to the war? I think they failed to understand Lavrov's role. Lavrov is not part of decision making in Russia. He doesn't have any control over foreign or security policy. Uh, he's a misogynist. Uh, he is there to make score points rhetorically. He knows history. He knows past diplomatic activities. He's very good on his feet. He can insult people. He can destroy arguments. He can press back. And this has nothing to do with actually negotiating with Russia. This is just him being the front person for this aggressive regime. And I think Western diplomats tend to think that their counterparts are like them. That, oh, so I'm the foreign minister of the UK, I sit in the cabinet, I discuss these things with the prime minister, we think about what our policy should be. That does not describe Lavrov's role at all. He's not even in the room. It's fascinating. And, and from your experience, um, that must be an ongoing um, deficiency with Western diplomats, is it? Yes, um, so it gets back to something we were talking about earlier, which is understanding power. Putin operates on the basis of power uh, and he wants to accumulate it and he wants to exercise it and he wants to maintain positions of power so he can use it in the future. And for him, weakness and instability and chaos surrounding Russia are fine because he can uh, exercise influence in those situations. We in the West, we tend to think the opposite way. We want stability, we want peace, we want problems to go away so we can get on with things. For Putin, that, that state of play is the goal in itself. We think in terms of end states. What's the end state? What does he want? He doesn't have an end state per se. He has a process, which is accumulate and exercise power. And that's how you make Russia greater and get Russia more respected. So we need to look at the world, not through the lens that we look at things through ourselves, but we need to understand that he looks at the world differently, that he looks at it from a perspective of power. And if we want to be taken seriously, or if we want to influence his decision-making, we need to be dealing with the facts on the ground that he can observe and react to, to show where power really lies. If we talk about off-ramps, all that tells him is we want an off-ramp. Uh, if we talk about negotiations, he views that as an opportunity to achieve what he wants without having to fight for it. 
this is there's no <laughs> there's no let up here. However, if he sees, and maybe he is beginning to see this, that his military is not performing, that the West is actually arming Ukraine now, and Ukraine is pushing back, that will cause him to adjust. And one adjustment we've seen in the last two and a half weeks is claiming that, oh, we never wanted to take Kiev and overthrow the government of Ukraine. All we wanted to do was take Eastern Ukraine and connect the land bridge. So he's already re-articulated his war aims as a result of facts on the ground. That's the way he reacts to power. Um, one of the most striking things in the few, first few days of the war um, was the incompetence of the Russian military. Um, thinking in, 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 so this question is is in response to your, he, he re reacts to things on the ground. Um, I, I read many and heard many um, reports that he's isolated, his um, generals only tell him what he wants to hear. And by the way, they've lost now nine generals in the field. And I think America's lost two since 1945, which is incredible. Um, do you, did you buy that, that he's isolated? He's not, he's, he doesn't really know what's going on or do you think he's fully aware? I think it's somewhere in between. I do think that as a dictator, the people who serve him are afraid to tell him the truth if it's not something he wants to hear. So in terms of, you know, gee, Mr. President, I hate to tell you, but your military is crap because we stole all the money. They're not going to tell him that. Um, I say, oh, you know, actually, Mr. President, Ukraine is a country and the people are very motivated and they do. There is a historically different and unique Ukrainian nation. He doesn't want to hear that. So they won't tell him those things. Uh, but he's not fully isolated. You know, he, he can get information. He can get news. He processes it through his own filters, of course, as anybody would. And his are extreme filters. But uh, he's not completely isolated either. Uh, there is speculation that COVID enhanced that sense of isolation. He saw fewer people, especially fewer people from the West for about two years. So he was not getting alternative perspectives there. Uh, and then I think that he realized at a certain point that he was not getting or that he had not been given the straight story because he's, he could see that the things are not going according to plan. So he fired a lot of generals. I think he's fired more than were killed. So we're talking 20 plus generals out of commission now. Uh, he put some of his intelligence service leaders under house arrest. There's a news report, I don't know if it's true or not, that the person who had been charged with building up these so-called people's republics, Luhansk and Donetsk in Ukraine, Vladislav Sorkov was put under house arrest. Don't know if it's true or not, but that would be an indicator as well that all these people I entrusted to do things failed. So a lot of finger pointing and scapegoating as a recognition, you know, and therefore getting the information in some way that this is not going well. And to articulate a new set of war aims after six weeks of, of you know, a hard slog and bad results indicates that something had to have happened here. There was also a um, story, you know, this is Kremlinology all over again. The defense minister and the head of the armed forces, um, Shoigu and Gerasimov, were basically not seen for, you know, week two to week six of the war, <laughs> claiming to be sick or claiming, you know, whatever, basically not seen. Uh, Shoigu has now recently been seen again, and the photograph was one of him sitting about as far from Putin as you and I are sitting, which, as you know from the Kremlin photographs, is unusual. Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, was in Moscow yesterday, and he's about as far from Putin as I am from the back wall of the room. Uh, so the imagery of bringing Shoigu closer was something maybe that Putin's trying to convey again. From your time at NATO, um, give us an understanding of how this war has strengthened NATO's mission, as opposed to its other multinational, um, supranational body, e the EU. Right. So NATO, in its strategic concept, agreed in 2010 says it has three core functions. It has defense and deterrence of its members, you know, defending its members. 
It has crisis management, so dealing with security crises in the world. Uh, and remember, Afghanistan was a big part of what NATO was involved with for you know, 20 years. And the third is cooperative security. So working with others who are not members to build security in the world. And we had a lot of struggles within NATO. We had countries, many countries who did not pay 2% of GDP, even though they had agreed multiple times to do so, just would never deliver and do it. We had uh, conflicts such as in Libya, where I think only eight of the, at the time, 26 NATO members agreed to take part. Uh, so a very small number saying, yeah, we'll, we'll vote for it, but we won't do it. That's a bad sign as well. Um, so, and I, I should add too, you, we, we can't forget President Trump questioning whether you know, we should come to the defense of allies who were attacked if they have not paid 2% of GDP on defense. Uh, you know, ap apocrypha in NATO speak, you know, you don't question collective defense. And we did that because of the lack of, um, of defense spending by some countries. So, and that led to a big counter reaction within NATO against the United States. So that's the situation going into 2020 and 2022. And now I think NATO has really rallied around the mission of collective defense, that they've seen Russia attack a sovereign and independent European state, commit war crimes, conduct these attacks with the utmost brutality. And they see that, okay, we cannot be seen to be weak. We have to convey an ironclad commitment to collective defense. We have to back it up with capability that is seen. So hence the deployment of forces into Poland, Romania, Baltic states, more US forces flowing back into Europe, forces from other NATO countries, West Europeans moving to Central and Eastern Europe, like France or the Netherlands or Germany, in order to demonstrate unanimity and resolve with the NATO about collective defense. So that has been a real shot in the arm for the core mission, number one. However, by doing that, it inadvertently conveys a sense that, well, Ukraine, you're not a member of NATO, and so we're not going to do anything to defend you. And so we're making all this effort to show that we will protect countries that are not under attack, while the one country that is under attack, we're saying you're on your own. Uh, so that was not a good showing for NATO. Uh, I think that that turned, if you remember, we had in the last six weeks, I think four cabinet level or presidential level meetings at NATO. We had a defense minister's meeting, a foreign minister's meeting, presidential level summit, and then another foreign minister's meeting. The, the most recent foreign minister's meeting, which was about two and a half, three weeks ago, I think that was the turning point where NATO finally came to the conclusion that we actually have to help Ukraine win here. It, what, it's not enough to look around and say, well, what can we do that might help, but isn't too provocative? And you know, Russia won't think that we're joining the effort. So giving them Stinger missiles or Javelin anti-tank uh, systems, we would do that, but we weren't providing heavy armor, we weren't providing artillery, we weren't providing aircraft, we weren't providing attack drones. So many things we were not willing to do. And I think at that last NATO meeting where Secretary Blinken was present, uh, you got the feeling that it had changed, that the US had changed policy after President Biden's visit to Poland. And then Blinken brought that change to NATO. And I think timed as it was after the um, retreat of the Russians from north of Kyiv, so people could feel that, oh, Ukraine's actually able to push back here and the exposure of these horrendous atrocities of just execution of civilians in Bucha, I think that gave NATO the resolve to sort of commit itself now to, we actually have to help Ukraine win this war. I hate to say this, but is it, I mean, it, it, it's a bit embarrassing that it took that long. Yes, I agree. And, you know, I, I have spent the last seven years, seven years, five years, the last five years, focusing almost full-time on Ukraine along with other things in one way or another in the US government or think tanks or um, consulting work. And I could see a lot of the things that we're talking about. Ukraine's sense of national identity, the will to fight, 
um, the fact that they are a democracy and that they are fighting for the values that define all of us. So, but I can understand why people who have not steeped themselves in Ukraine for the last five years would not necessarily see that. The public narrative of Ukraine going into this most recent iteration of the war was that a uh, corrupt country um, never got its act together after independence, uh, political football in the United States, subject of impeachment hearings in the US. So, you know, do we really want to get that, you know, sucked into this? And I think that it's understandable, but it's unfortunate because that's not the reality of Ukraine. So one or two more questions for me, and then um, we'll, we'll certainly turn the microphone to the audience. We are, you know, we're in the Leadership Center, Church Leadership Center. You were the uh, first executive director of the McCain Institute, uh, another admiral leader, admirable leader himself. What does Zelen President Vol Volodymyr Zelensky's leadership, at least in the past two months, what, what, what has struck you about that? And like you said, are you surprised by his leadership? So it's the second part. First, I'm not surprised. So I met President Zelensky before he was president when he was in the campaign against then President Poroshenko. This was February of 2019. And I was really struck by his sincerity, that he was coming from outside of politics and he wanted to change things. And he knew that Ukrainian people were sick of the same old, same old in politics and corruption and money. And he said, we got to change this. So he knew he had the wind at his back and he was speaking on behalf of the aspirations of the Ukrainian people. So he, he, he was really committed to this. He didn't know how to do it. And he was surrounding himself with smart people trying to come up with policies and plans so that if elected, what do you do? And then I went to his inauguration and on the day of his inauguration, he gave a firebrand of a speech and dismissed the parliament and said, we're gonna have a new election and I want everybody to go out and you know, get a fresh mandate and we're going to reform this country. So he really was passionate about this. So I'm not surprised that in a situation of being, the country being attacked and needing a leader to stand up and articulate the will of the Ukrainian people to call for international assistance, be a great communicator because he comes out of, of media. I'm not surprised by that at all. In between those points in time, of course, there was a period of governance of Ukraine, which was very difficult and he didn't get as much done as he wanted to do. His popularity sagged, uh, but he turned out to be exactly the right person for being a symbolic and articulate leader of the country during wartime. And uh, I think uh, bringing up the McCain Institute, one of the first things that we did when we founded the McCain Institute was go around and interview people uh, in positions of leadership. So you know, various US senators or governors, and military leaders, how do you define leadership? What, what is leadership? And the one that stuck with me, uh, and it was a US senator who said it, is simple, uh, courage and integrity. So you, you've got to be, you know, pure in your purposes and transparent, and you have to be willing to take a risk. You have to have courage to do the right thing. And I think that Zelensky has demonstrated exactly that, courage and integrity. So if President Putin only understands power and will most likely not accept any sort of rational, reasonable outcome, from your experience point of view, what do, what do you think is the end game for this war? Although with the big caveat, of course, both in history and current affairs, we have no idea what's gonna happen. Right, well, thank you for the caveat because we have no idea, anything can happen. Uh, we have to always remember that anything can happen. But what looks like it's going to happen is Putin is going to try to assemble something that he can claim to be a victory by May 9th, land bridge, taking Mariupol, more of Donbass, wrapping it up and saying, we achieved our goals. And then seeking to, uh, to, to de-escalate the war a bit into a low level conflict, as had been the case for the last eight years. So to bring it back to something like that, the Ukrainians are going to try to prevent that. 
they're, they're, they're going to try to prevent him keeping the land bridge from taking all of Donbass. They're still going to try to save Mariupol. They're going to push back on Kherson in the south and deny him that kind of victory. And even if he declares that victory, the Ukrainians will keep fighting. And the Ukrainians ultimately, having been through this before, have decided not again. We are not going to, to accept a situation where people pressure us to allow Russian forces to occupy part of our territory in the name of some ceasefire so everybody can go back to their coffee shops. We're not doing it. We are going to push these Russian forces out this time. That's what the Ukrainians will do. Uh, I think what actually happens is the Russian military cannot succeed on its own merits. It is They've lost too much combat power, too many personnel, poor training, poor command and control, poor equipment, poor coordination of arms offenses. They will not be able to succeed. The military pressure on them will continue. And the sanctions pressure on the Russian economy, on the other hand, continues to pressure Russia as well. And if we can get the Europeans to get off of Russian oil and gas, that will accelerate this effect because it will deny a significant source of revenue to Russia. So what happens is Russia experiences a slow defeat while Ukraine pushes back and the West pushes back on the economy. And at that point, I think Russia has to come to terms with settling the war uh, within their own borders. Uh, they're not there yet. We can't see that yet today, how we get there. But I think the, the forces are in play that that's where it drives the outcome. Thank you, Ambassador. So uh, if everyone please raise your hand, I'll, I'll bring in the microphone. So I'm, we have plenty of time, we'll get to them. I'm gonna start with you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your very valuable insights. It's been extremely interesting. My question is, the port of Odessa is the key to Ukrainian agricultural exports. Without the port of Odessa, it becomes a landlocked country. And my question for you is, what are Putin's plans for um, Odessa? And do you think he can achieve them? Do you think he can occupy Odessa? And, and how hard will the Ukrainians be? Because it seems to me that without Odessa, they're, they're not a country in the sense that they are now. Yeah. Uh, for, so first off, you're absolutely right about the significance of Odessa. It is the premier access to the sea for Ukraine. And it is where agricultural exports, steel, coal, et cetera, could go through there. Even without Mariupol, where some of the coal and steel had gone through, you could still get it across and go out through Odessa. So it's very important that way. It's important partly because the rail routes and the land routes, west and north, uh, Poland, Slovakia, EU, were never developed during the Soviet Union. So those, that infrastructure doesn't exist there, whereas you could be a landlocked country, you know, like a Hungary, like an Austria, and be fine. But that's not the case with Ukraine, because those things don't exist, and Odessa does exist. So it is tremendously important. The second is, it is Putin's plan, I believe, to take the entire southern coast and connect Russian territory through Mariupol, land bridge to Crimea, and west from there, through Mykolaiv and Odessa, and all the way to Transnistria and Moldova. That's what they would like to do. I don't believe they have the capability to do it. I think that what we've seen with their attacks on Kyiv and their inability to mount operations at a distance with, with terrible supply chains shows that they couldn't do that. The Ukrainians took out the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, uh, the Moskva, uh, which meant that the Russians had to pull many of their other Black Sea ships back away from the Ukrainian coast. Uh, so you, Russia's ability to mount an offensive against Odessa is significantly diminished. You may have heard that in the past couple of nights, they have increased bombardment around Nikolaev, which is the city that is guarding Odessa. So they're trying, but I just don't think they're going to be able to succeed. Um, so one question online first, and then we'll go to you. So um, one question online was, why are some Western leaders, or well, one leader in Hungary, the other who was potential leader, Marine Le Pen, 
Why do you think they ha are soft, quote unquote, on, on Russia? Well, there are different reasons for different people. And I think Marine Le Pen looks at it through a cultural prism, much like some of the far right in other countries, both here and in Europe, where they see Putin as a strong leader, someone who's defending Russian nation, Russian nationalism, Russian, Russian religion and culture and tradition. And this is something that she wants to do in France for France. And so she sees a parallel. And you could see this in the far right in Italy or the far right in Germany. Uh, you could see this to a lesser degree um, in Poland. They, they have no affinity for Russia at all, but the far right in Poland still talk about national symbols and identity, even in the far right here. So I think that describes her to some degree. Orban, I think, is completely different. Orban, I would see as someone who looks at the EU as, a hypo as hypocritical, uh, looks at the US as hypocritical, says, look, you say that we have to be tough on Russia, we have to sanction Russia and all that. Where's Germany you know, making all its money? Germany is building Nord Stream 2. Germany is buying the Russian gas. The Italian luxury goods are going back and forth with Russia. The French want to do deals with Russia. Why should we be chumps? Why should we be the ones who play by the book here when nobody else does? And even beyond that, you can say, even if others are moving ahead with sanctions on Russia and trying to get off of Russian gas. He said, well, we're gonna look out for our national interest here. We don't have a, a natural supply of energy for Hungary. We need to do business with Russia. Doesn't mean we support Russia. Doesn't mean we want Russia to take us over, but we're gonna do business. So that's kind of his mentality. So it's different in different places, but there is many places this undercurrent of well, we have to live with Russia. We have to work with Russia. Russia is a powerful European country. You know, we can't be in conflict with Russia. You get a lot of that out of Germany. Uh, still, even now, you get a lot of that out of Germany. I would say, though, I, I think attitudes are changing and the, the, things are catching up. As you see Russia slowly being defeated in Ukraine, as you see the atrocities and the war crimes, you see the Germans coming around on Russian energy, finally, uh, I think all that's gonna change. Um, so I am a historian. Um, I spent a lot of time the last couple of years reading a lot of old George Kennan uh, material. I, was, I wrote a book about the Yalta Conference and in going over that history of 1945 and just after, Kennan in the Long Telegram and the Mr. X article says, that like, as you were saying, that there's not necessarily an end game by which a particular objective has to be achieved, but the modus operandi is exploit and seek out instability and uh, confusion and that Russia then or the Soviet Union will recede in the face of stiff resistance. So if that's the case, you agree that that's still true today and that does that give us more latitude to push back significantly more forcefully on Putin than we have because of fears of escalation where he'll create any, he'll, he'll say anything we do is a reason to ex escalate kind of regardless of whether it's economic, humanitarian or military. And second, you had talked about uh, kind of Putin's, uh, his essay in the summer expressing that he doesn't believe that Ukraine is a country. So there's kind of a duality with Russia where on the one hand, you can't take any agreement that they make at face value and you always have to doubt the sincerity of commitments that they're making uh, abroad. But on the other hand, there are certain things that you absolutely have to take at face value where they're telling us exactly who they are. So where is that divide? <laughs> well, there's so many things that you brought up, which are great to talk about. And I hope I can remember all of them. Because Sorry, too many questions. <laughs> there's more, a, there's a lot myself. in there. First off, you described Stalin's mentality leading the Soviet Union. And I think Putin shares a similar mentality of force and exploiting weakness and, and doing that again and again and again. And I, I do see that. Second, uh, Putin faults the leaders of the Soviet Union and also the leaders of the Russian Empire at the end of uh, uh, World War, uh, I'm sorry, the, the end of the Russian Empire during World War I and then the early Bolsheviks for giving away Russian lands as he saw them. That they, they were failed leaders because they didn't defend and expand the country. And he sees himself as someone who is recovering the Russian lands 
and wants to be remembered in the same category as Catherine the Great and Peter the Great. So he, he looks at it through those. And he, and he views the Soviet leaders as failing because of um, um, lack of strength, you know, and lack of toughness. And he also views them as, yeah. as clouded by ideology, that they, they believe too much their own ideology. They believe too much what the West would say. They didn't believe enough in Russian nationalism and the Russian state. So I think all of those things are motivators. Um, what else was part of your question? There are so many things. We push back more forcefully, and when do we take him at his word? That's the key one. Thank you. Um, we talked about Lavrov a little bit. When you listen to Russian leaders speak, you don't need to listen to what they say as much as you need to ask yourself, why are they saying it? Because they are trying to influence. They're trying to shape our thinking, shape our reactions, our sense of what's possible. So when Putin threatens to escalate nuclear weapons, chemical, biological, whatever, uh, when Lavrov comes out and says, oh, it'll be World War III, the nuclear threat is real, um, they're doing this because they want to get inside our heads to deter us from doing things. Why are they trying to get inside our heads and deter us from doing things? Because they don't want us to do those things. <laughs> they, they are having a hard time fighting the Ukrainian military as it is. The last thing they want is the West to actually become engaged more directly in the conflict. So they are trying to scare us off of that through that kind of rhetoric. So yes, we have a lot more latitude and not just latitude, but a necessity to actually push back more firmly on Russia with credibility to try to prevent his use of escalation to advance his objectives and deter the West. The one that is particularly important right now is these threats about use of nuclear weapons. We went through decades of the possibility of nuclear use. Terrible time, no one ever wants to be in that situation. But the reality is we didn't have nuclear use. And that's because we had a very clear doctrine of retaliation and uh, any nuclear use would result in mutual assured destruction of both sides. Then you get to this tactical use of nuclear weapons because we've never developed a significant number of tactical nuclear weapons, but Russia has. So they could use a nuclear weapon on a battlefield and it's even, in theory, it's in their doctrine that they would do so. If they're losing, they can escalate in order to de-escalate. I think it's a flawed doctrine. I don't think the use of a tactical nuclear weapon actually achieves anything on the battlefield. But I think we need to be communicating to Russia, if they reach for a nuclear weapon, there will be a forceful military response against their invasion force in Ukraine. But we're not going to sit still and let nuclear weapons be used. I don't know if we've communicated that through private channels to their military or not. I hope we have because I think it's essential, because if they know that their military will be destroyed, then it takes away the value even of that tactical nuclear use. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, Ambassador Volker, uh, thank you for your service and your integrity. Um, what is happening in Ukraine right now, it's um, a terror. Um, I mean, rounding up civilians, shooting them. Um, I mean, the quantity we could we could debate, but um, this has crossed a line to me. Um, do you think it reminds me of the 1980s movie Red Dawn, the Soviet invasion of the United States? Um, do you think that's um, it was planned from the beginning? This terror of the civilian population. Uh, did it come from the top? Did it just get a bunch of wild animals? Uh, out of control and allowed to continue to perpetuate atrocities? Uh, and is this terror directed at all towards other countries and toward the Russian people to say, this is what happens or this is what, what, what could happen to you if you revolt? So several things that come to mind with your question. One of them is, Russia thought they would win quickly and easily 
so they wouldn't have to have this indiscriminate brutality. They would have discriminant brutality. They had a, a list of people who they viewed as Ukrainian nationalists who were a threat to Russia, who they would have picked up and put into prisons and put into Siberia, tortured or killed some, very much a 1956 or 1968 playbook. Uh, that's the way they were thinking there. Another thing, um, their only recent experience with warfare on a scale is Syria, where they have engaged in these types of atrocities. Uh, it's what their forces have gotten used to doing. They, they, they don't view the Syrians as equivalent human beings. And so they're willing to just engage in the worst abuses. Third is they have talked about the, the, pol the political level and Putin has talked about the Ukrainian people and leadership in inhuman terms, uh, referring to them as Nazis, as banderistas, as fascists, as um, brainwashed by the West, as not really, you know, not even knowing who they are. Are they Jewish? Are they Russian? Are they, you know, are they Ukraine? They have no idea who they are. So really dehumanizing them. And that is a message also to the military forces. You don't have to play by any rules. And then finally, about not playing by rules, there isn't the kind of training and accountability in the Russian armed forces that there is in Western armed forces. So there is kind of an impunity for people doing whatever. And uh, that unfortunately, when Russia ran into uh, effective military counterforce, then just led them to use whatever means they felt like. Thank you, Ambassador. Can you talk a little bit about um, what this chaos could mean for President Putin's leadership uh, personally, as well as uh, uh, for Russian leadership, um, and particularly given Russia's history of um, uh, political chaos and, and revolution in the wake of losing foreign wars, Afghanistan, um, World War I, and if you go even further back, historians have talked about the uh, Russo-Japanese War. So that's a, that's a real trend line there. Yeah. So first off, I think the most important thing that we can say with confidence is that Putin has not left himself a way out. Uh, he has committed to a military victory over Ukraine in order to rebuild a Russian empire on the ashes of the former Soviet Union, correcting the wrongs that he feels were done in the past. So, and he has, it has gone badly for him militarily, and he's brought incredible pressure on the uh, Russian economy. He's, he, everything has gone badly. So he, he cannot claim to be leading successfully unless he pulls a success out of this. And so he's left himself no other way but forward through trying to get a military victory. I don't believe he can achieve it. I, I think that he's placed his bets and placed them in a way where he's going to lose those bets. And that then gets to the question, well, then what happens? And nobody can give you a mechanism. Like, how did all of a sudden the, the czarist regime experience a revolution in 1905? Or how did it experience this at the end of uh, World War I? And um, how did you, know, you have these changes after the loss of Afghanistan? You can't describe the mechanism. And you look at Russia today and you see that, all right, there are multiple centers of power, all of whom had agreed on Putin being at the center. The, the Sviloviki, uh, the former KGB people, the intelligence services, the military, military intelligence services, the state-owned enterprises, the private oligarchs, those who control the media, uh, a whole network of control that recognized Putin as the center. They must know that this is going badly. Many of them are probably worried about their positions, their wealth, their families, the country. And they see that he's destroying the country. Does this translate into them removing him from power or forcing him to accept a, a withdrawal? 
I don't see how that happens. Putin is clearly worried about it because he has arrested several generals. He has put house arrests uh, on some of his intelligence services. He fired his entire household staff in order to replace them with people who might be less, um, uh, less confident about maybe doing something to him in the household. So uh, he's clearly worried about the possibility of something internal going against him. He's, he's called oligarchs back. He's forced them to choose. You're either in or you're out, um, but you're not part of Russia if you're out. Uh, so we don't see the mechanism, but we do see the forces building. And so I, I, have, to, I have to believe that there's, there's no way that Russia comes back as a country with Putin still in power. It will be subject to all these international sanctions. There'll be a global pariah. They, there will be this constant support for Ukraine. Russia doesn't come back with Putin there. After he's not there, whatever that means, I think there will be a search for re-engaging Russia. And I just hope that when we are at that point, there's also a search for Russia reconciling with its actions and its past. Thank you. Since we're at the Churchill Leadership Center, can you connect up for us some of the lessons learned or not learned from Churchill's leadership? Well, the, my favorite one is that Churchill reportedly said that you can always count on the United States to do the right thing after it has exhausted all of the other alternatives. <laughs> and, and I think we are kind of watching that again in our support for Ukraine. We were reluctant, we were slow, we were half steps, half steps, half steps. But I think we're finally in the mode of recognizing that we can't allow Putin to, to succeed in Ukraine. And we don't want to live in a Europe with a Russia led by Putin in the future. So we're going to help Ukraine. Uh, I think that, that has clicked now. Um, the other thing that, of course, the Churchill is most famous for is this unbreakable resolve, as it just no matter what, he would stand up and say, we will fight, we will fight, we will fight. And the British people needed to hear that. And I think that is what Zelensky is doing as well. And what I see in Ukraine, I, I, I can't speak to the, the Churchill time, um, but what I see in Ukraine is that the Ukrainian people are that way. They will fight. They will do this till the end. And Zelensky is both leading those people, but reflecting those people as well. He could not be the leader of Ukraine and not be espousing that, that unbreakable resolve. Um, <clears throat> Ambassador, I'll, I'll add to that, and then I, I think we do have to end. But church, the, you bring up a, a very important point about Church's wartime leadership. He embodied the British people's resilience. Without their resilience, he would be hollow. It would not have been effective. Um, that's not to say him personally, of course, was not courageous, because of course he was. But yeah, the, the embodiment of, of the will of the people is, is the most important part when talking about Churchill's wartime leadership. And one of my favorite quotes, which you may recognize and chuckle at is, there's nothing, the only thing worse than not having allies is having allies. So I don't, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, President Zelensky is feeling that way right now. Yeah, um, I, I have had a lot of conversations with people in Ukraine over the last several weeks, some close to President Zelensky, some in opposition, some just former officials and so forth. And there was uniformly a great deal of frustration with the West and the United States. They felt that we did not understand them that they are fighting for our values, freedom, democracy, human rights, security, sovereignty, independence, security in Europe. They're the front line. And somehow we didn't understand that that's what was happening. So a tremendous amount of frustration. But I also have to say that as we have risen to the challenge more in the past few weeks, you hear less of that. And you hear more a sense that we are actually on side together. And I'll just close with this, this one observation. Uh, I was watching the meetings that Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin had in Ukraine 
And then Secretary Austin's leading of a meeting of NATO defense uh, ministries in Ramstein in Germany this week. And you really do get the sense that now um, they have decided that, okay, rather than defining what we can't do, we're going to sit down with the Ukrainians, figure out what is needed, figure out what we can do, help them do as much as they can, train them. We're not limiting to Soviet era equipment. We'll give them Western equipment. We'll train them on Western equipment. We'll give them help with strategy and tactics so they can plan better. And we're going to bring 40 other countries around the table as well so that it's not only the United States and maybe we're not even the best one to do something if someone else can do it. I think that is a big change. And I think that we will see um, more, uh, more understanding from the Ukrainians that finally we get what this is about. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and, and of course, service to the country. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.